Yes, that's right. Joe here for Joyrider TV, live with some more Q&A. Would you believe it? Yes, you would, because that's what it said on the title of the video. Thanks for tuning in, everybody who's already here. Very nice. As advertised on the, um, the title, <coughs> we're going to be looking at exit strategies. Yes. Um, so what we're going to be looking at is when you're out sailing, when it's a bit windy and you kind of know that the cap size is inevitable, right? Uh, when is it time? When is it um, the right thing to do to get off the boat? And what is the best way that you should be doing it? Um, this topic has actually been brought to light by, you're not going to believe it, it was by Old Fart on a BMX. Yes, um, he said, so uh, the idea is to jump when you know going over is inevitable. So I thought we'd have a look at that. And then after that, I'll check in with everybody who's checking in. Uh, and before we do that, I'll just let anybody know who hasn't been before. Uh, this is a live recording of a Q&A session. Or if you're watching it live, it's not even a recording. It's actually happening. Um, and if you've got any questions at all on the topic of catamaran sailing or anything else, I should think, um, just either put it in the live chat if you're here live or if you're not, put it in the comments below and uh, then I will respond to your question in next week's Q&A. Yes. All right. So I've written some notes uh, on this topic of um, safe, safely dismounting from the boat. So the main objective uh, when it looks like it is inevitable that you are going to capsize and you know that you're going to end up in the water. Um, so this perhaps isn't looking at when to get off, but what we're trying to achieve is the first thing is to not get stuck. There are a lot of things on the catamaran which we could get stuck on. So um, if we can control our entry into the water, um, then it means we're much less likely to get tangled up in ropes, in the trampoline lacing, um, in rigging, anything at all, which is why sometimes it is appropriate to uh, hit the eject button before the top of the mast hits the water, um, because that way you're going to have more choice of where you can land in the water. Um, the second objective when we're going to end up in the water is you are still going to want to be within reach, you know, um, in contact with the boat, because especially if it's windy, the boat um, is going to drift probably quicker than you can swim. If it's windy and the boat's on its side, um, probably even an Olympic swimmer uh, wouldn't be able to keep up with 20 knots of wind, boat on its side. Uh, the boat on its side is going to go uh, too quick to keep up with, especially if you're swimming with your buoyancy aid on, with your trapeze harness, that stuff. Then, yeah, you want to have a hand on something, whether it's the main sheet, whether it's your trapeze wire, um, whether it's actually the hull, something like that. So there we go. So um, before you even head out sailing, this is quite important. Um, I feel that of late we are going down a very safety oriented route, but I think it is important because we want to have the same amount of sailors coming back in uh, that went out. Um, so before you head out, if you have got an inexperienced crew or even a crew that you haven't capsized with before, perhaps just give them a small briefing on what to do in the event of a capsize. If 
you think there is any chance of a cap size being on the cards. Of course, we don't want to scare people who haven't sailed a catamaran before, making them think, oh my God, we're definitely going to capsize. So, you know, bad things could happen. No, we want to lay it to them pretty gently so that they are informed, but not put off. This is a fine balance that we're trying to achieve. So um, the most likely way that people are going to get caught on something on the boat, um, I really should have a magnetic person by now, but if this is our boat and it's capsized this way, so in fact, can we use this as a, um, just as a model? So if we're sailing like this and we're going over this way, if you slide down the trampoline on your front, so quite a common thing to happen to get caught. This is the most common way of getting caught and we should try to avoid it. As the boat's going to capsize, this happens more if the people are sat on the boat than if they're out on the trapeze like this. And the crew, less experienced perhaps, is trying to hang on to, if it's a 16, onto the sidebar, or if it's something else, maybe onto the shroud. What that's going to do is put them on their front with their head up towards the top, holding on here. And if they let go from that position, they're going to slide down feet first, trapeze hook going like this, not to scale, uh, going like this, which means anything that's there, that trapeze hook is quite likely just to hook into, and it's going to be very difficult to get out. So um, especially with a boat with a uh, trampoline lacing that runs down the middle, this is the most likely thing to happen with, where it goes wrong, is sliding down like this, hook goes through the trampoline lacing, um, and boat ends up on its side. And then, of course, the, the weight of the crew is the wrong side here, which is going to pull the boat down more quickly. I don't need to spell out what could happen next but it could be pretty, pretty poor, uh, the situation. So first thing, you definitely should have a trapeze harness with a quick release hook so that if that happened and it was like, whoa, the boat's coming over on top of me, I'm hooked in, the crew as well should be briefed on how to release the quick release hook and they just release the hook then they can just slide down into the water and the situation is going to be much better. Um, but we're trying to avoid this front first, feet, feet first descent into the water, down the trampoline. This is the worst thing that we can do when we capsize if we're sat on the boat. There we go. That's an opening gambit. So. What should you do? This is a good question um, because it's nice to hang on to the top, but you should hang on to the top um, knowing that you don't want to be sliding down the trampoline. So perhaps just to even on land, show the crew this is what you don't want to do. So if you do find yourself hanging on to the top, just be ready to kind of twist around and slide down the trampoline on your side, or better still, on your back. So you go feet first, but sliding down on your back into the water. Not easy, but it's definitely good to know of the dangers that are involved. And that is one of the key dangers involved uh, with catamaran sailing, uh, when it's windy especially. Um, so when to eject, because if you can eject, go into the water before the top of the mast hits the water, you're going to have more choice of how you're going to lower yourself in. So 
The question here is, do you know when is the point of no return? Uh, when we talk about the point of no return, um, if here's our boat, very low profile hulls. So we're flying the hull. That is not even close to the point of no return because we've got a lot more weight out on this side than the leverage of the mast on this side. But as we go up, when it gets that high, this is absolutely on the limit. And if it goes any higher, yes, we have crossed the point of no return. So that is when uh, it would be worth looking at pulling the eject handle and getting off the boat. So if you sat on the boat, just sliding down on the bottom uh, into the water, that's nice. Better still, if you're sat on the boat, try to hold on to the top as long as you can. And then when it's all finished, you can just step down onto the boom, try to step onto the boom rather than fall onto it. And then you'll kind of put one foot on the boom and then just kind of fall to the back of the mainsail. So on an upwind point of sail or a sideways capsize, we're always trying to exit off the back because um, that's going to keep us clear of all of round here. This is where all of the stuff is that um, we could hurt ourselves on. We could get caught on. So if we can get to the back, this is ideal. So once we're at the point beyond the point of no return, that is the time to start thinking about ejecting from the boat. Um, just reading my notes. All right, yeah, the hang on. And then if you are on the trapeze, point of no return, then what we want to do is when we know it's going to go, because if the boat capsizes completely and we're still on the trapeze, the boat's going to slow down a fair bit which is going to try to make us go forwards, which is going to send us towards the mast. Um, and that is definitely not where we want to go because that is hurt yourself area. So before the mast hits the water, if we know we're past the point of no return, and you might have seen this manoeuvre in the video that I made where it was the most wind I'd ever sailed um, it was a, a 16 with a red and yellow sail. And you might have actually thought, hold on, he's jumped off the boat before it's even capsized. Yeah, for this exact reason, because we were beyond the point of no return. I knew that we were going. So I jumped towards the back of the mainsail. All right. So then if you have jumped into the water like that, if you're the helm on the boat, make sure the crew's coming with you because it's just unfair to get off the boat, a bit like I did, without the crew uh, having the option to do so as well. But then you should have the trapeze with you. So then when you've settled in the water, unhook from the trapeze, but hold on to the handle because this is your lifeline back to the boat. Uh, because as we said, the boat is going to drift very fast on its side. Um, so you want to be holding on to it in some way um, to get back. So that is the sideways when to eject. Now, uh, the pitch pole when to eject. So for the uninitiated um, out there, um, a pitch pole is when we're sailing along. Uh, winds coming from here. It's more likely to be on a point of sail. Here we go. We've got some art, art and crafts department have been very busy. It's more likely to be on this sort of point of sail or maybe like this, if this is the wind coming from the top. And we're overloading this bow. This bow goes into the water and the boat flips over. Now, the um, sudden slowing down that you experience when you stick the bow into the water like that is going to send the helm and the crew flying forwards. Um, yeah. So there's a few things to, um, 
to think about. It's a real balance here on if you are sticking the nose in, if it's a boat where you know that if the bow goes under the water, that's it, it's game over. Like on a Hobie 16, definitely on a Hobie 14. I dare say on many of the asymmetric hull prindles, it's the same where you've got a really fat deck on the boat um, and not much volume in the bow. Once that deck goes under the water, that's it, you're going. So if you know that you're going and you're on the trapeze, best thing to do, first, let's backpedal a little bit. Before we even get to this situation, um, we want to make sure if we're sailing fast on a reach, we haven't got any ropes caught around, like wrapped around our hand, caught around our feet. Um, because if we get flung forwards and we've got a rope wound around our hand, we could injure our hand, which we don't want to do, obviously. So make sure you're clear of any ropes. Um, yes, you want to be holding on, but so that if you open your hand, then you're free. Um, and then when you know that you're going, the danger on the pitch pole is if we kind of don't, um, if we're not careful, we could go in to the jib and the, uh, the forestay. So to avoid going into the jib or the forestay, we just want to just give it a little boost, see bending the legs, little boost away from the boat. And that way we end up in the water in front of the boat. And yes, we've got our trapeze with us. So we know um, that we can get back to the boat. But in any situation where you've got the trapeze with you, um, where you're hooked in, as soon as you're in the water and you come to the surface, unhook, um, but hold on. Very important. Unhook, but hold on. However, if you're sailing a boat which has a more streamlined deck profile, like perhaps any F-18, Tornado, Hurricane 5.9, Prindle 19, anything like that, where you can dig the nose in, but you can save it, then if you are out on the trapeze and you can hold your position on the trapeze and not go flying forwards, then there is a chance if when the bows go in, um, you let the jib off, let the mainsail off, then there is a chance that you can save it. So don't go with it if you think there is a chance that you can save it. A lot of the time on those types of boats, um, like on a tornado, for example, nine times out of 10, when there's a trapezing situation pitch pole, it's actually the weight of the helm and the crew swinging forwards on the trapeze that actually pulls the boat over. Whereas if they'd have managed to stay at the back, you'd have saved it. Yeah, it's true. Um, yeah, so there we go. Final one is if you stick the nose in and you're sat on the boat. Now, this is the real exception to everything. If you're sat on the boat and you're sticking the bows in, do everything you can to hold on to the back of the boat. So if you're the helm, what I would do is actually get an arm. Uh, this is what an arm looks like around the back beam, um, because what you definitely don't want to be doing if you sat on the boat is to go sliding forwards, because up where the front beam is, this is what might be called a world of pain, um, <laughs> especially if you're not wearing a wetsuit. Um, with legs on it, there's all sorts of things which is there to get you. So um, hold on to something towards the back of the boat. If you're the crew, yes, you can hold on to the helm as long as he's holding on to something as well. So there we go. Um, so I think that pretty much covers it. I de I'll, I'll check out the live chat, obviously, to see if anything um, else is there on the topic. So um, there we go. Thanks very much, Old Fart on a BMX, for the question. 
I think it was a, a valuable question and we can um, take quite a lot away from that. So main thing, just to recap on our main objectives, you, the objectives are to not get stuck on any part of the boat and to stay with the boat. So it's real balance between, no, we don't want to be anywhere near any ropes, but yes, we'd like a bit of rope to hold on to so we don't get separated. Tricky balance. Um, the, another thing that is really going to work in your favour is while you're sailing along, if you're at, every time you've got even a second when you can take your eyes off the leeward bow or um, off the main sheet or what you're doing, scan the trampoline on the boat and just look for things that could be a hazard. Um, so if you see that there's a rope caught around something or the crew has got a rope wrapped around their ankle, anything like that. So we're constantly scanning to see, um, like we said in the Sam Holmes video, this what if, what if we capsize right now? Is something bad going to happen, which could be avoided if we just have a little tidy up, that sort of thing. Yeah, there we go. I think we'll leave that there. And uh, hello. So just checking in with everybody who's checking in in the live chat. We've got Mark on board in Ohio. Oh, um, says he survived the tornado outbreak just miles away last night. Praying for those who need help. Three fatalities so far. Crikey. I didn't even hear about that on the news. In um, I listened to the UK radio and it um, wasn't on the news. So, um, yeah, uh, hopefully there's, hopefully everybody is okay. Who's, um, who's okay. Yeah. Difficult way of, uh, difficult thing to say, isn't it? Because some people quite clearly aren't okay. But hopefully, um, yeah, we're with you. All right, we've got Office Hands Dave on board. Hello, cat people. Toots with us in Central Texas. Nice to have you with us, Toot. As always, um, yeah, so if you didn't know, which you maybe you probably didn't, um, Office Hands Dave, who has the handle Hobie 16 Amateur Hour, is going to be my, um, um, what would you call him? my wingman, my um, partner in crime um, up until when I get, when we get to Ocean Springs next week, in fact. This time, yeah, I'll delay this on you now, but next week, it will be Friday, won't it? Yeah. Next Friday, there won't be a and a because at the time of the Q&A, um, I will be sat on an airplane flying to America. Oh, yes. So uh, there won't be a and a next week on Friday. If I can reschedule, I will. And I'll let you know. Uh, the way that I'll let you know is by getting the and a announced a day early. So then you'll know it will be going on. But I really do have to look at what the schedule is because with going away, time is getting tight. Uh, Dave says, come and sail with Joe in Florida at, how do we pronounce this? Navari, Navar, uh, Navare. Um, but there in Florida, and that will be on Monday, the 25th of March in the afternoon and all day Tuesday, the 26th of March. That is where we'll be. Come down with your boat and we'll get out and we'll do some sharing the wind. Yes, we will. We'll do some synchronized hull flying, some good stuff, um, that kind of thing. I'm looking forward to it so much. Um, it's We're going to be at a place called uh, Juana's Pagoda, J-U-A-N-A, -A, Juana, I believe. It's Pagoda um, at those times. So hopefully we'll see some of you there. All right, we've got Ryan on board in Maui. Great to have you on board, uh, Ryan. Benny's with us in Sweden. Uh, Scott is dropping it in the slot, as he likes to do. Oh, and then Joyrider TV's on board. Yes, that's actually me. Um, yes, yeah, so an event coming up. 
which those of you in the US, you should be looking at because it's, I think it is from seeing the videos from it before. It's one of the highlights of the North American uh, calendar. It's the Cinco de Mayo regatta in Puerto Pensico, Mexico. It's the 3rd of May to the 5th of May. Um, yeah, so if you can get there, you should get there. Uh, it really does look like a great event. Uh, but when we're talking about events, of course, th uh, the start of April, we've got these two events at Ocean Springs, Mississippi, USA, where I'm going to be racing. The first one is from the 2nd of April, three days each event. Uh, the first one is the North American Hobie 14 Championships. The second one, which is starting, I believe, on the Friday, is the Midwinters East, which is an open competition for all types of catamaran. So if you can get down to Ocean Springs, Mississippi, USA, then you certainly should. It will be very good indeed. All of the information is on the internet. There we go. All right. Um, all right. And another one. Uh, this one's at Lake Buchanan, Texas, where there's the Eclipse Regatta on April the 8th. So everybody should get down to that one as well. Um, if you're not another one, there we go. All right, we got Armored Lion on board. I have a feeling I will be using this advice quite frequently. Oh, yeah. So um, very good to know when to get off the boat. Um, the main takeaway from the getting off the boat chat is you want to be able to control as much as is feasible your departure from the boat and your transition from boat to water. If you can control that, that really reduces the chances of something happening, like just banging into something. Um, you know, you see so many big bruises that people have got from hitting the um, the shroud or the forestay or the mast or the boom or the rudders or anything on the boat. So if you can uh, just keep it in mind, what would be your best exit exit strategy when it's windy? That is good. Just to go back to what I was saying before, um, on the bigger boats, where if you dig the bows in, one of the things that could save you is letting the main sheet off. Now, the exception to that is if you're sailing a boat which has a spinnaker, because if you stick the nose of the boat in, with the spinnaker up when it's windy and you let the main sheet out, that is actually, if you wanted to deliberately snap your mast, that would be the way to go about it. So if you've got your spinnaker up and you dig the nose in, don't let the main sheet out. Uh, yeah, don't let the main sheet out. Ease the spinnaker. Yes, please. Hold on on the side of the boat uh, as much as you can. Yes, but don't let the main sheet out because do you want an explanation? I thought you might. Um, so as the boat is charging along, the pressure in the rig is being greatly reduced by our boat speed because if our boat is traveling at a similar speed to the wind, there's not going to be so much pressure from behind trying to push the mast forwards. Whereas if we suddenly stop, all this pressure, so if there's 20 knots of wind, all that wind is going to go into the rig. It's going to go from being kind of here and it's going to come because our apparent wind is going to drop uh, very quickly. So it's going to go from there to more from behind us. And in fact, if we really stick the bows in, it's going to come almost from straight behind us like this. And then if at that point 
we let the main sheet out, the top section of the rig, basically above where the shroud's attached, there's no, the only thing supporting that top section of mast is the mainsail. And the mainsail is getting that support from the main sheet. Uh, the reason why it's a potential issue is because if this is our mast, these are the shrouds, this is the forestay, the spinnaker is pulling from here. So if we have no support pulling down like this way and we load it up with loads of pressure really suddenly, it will snap. There we go. I thought you might like to know. Uh, you probably knew that already because it isn't something that we haven't talked about before. Let's be fair. All right. So we got Aaron on board in New Zealand. It will be, I believe, half past five in the morning. Early bird catches the Q&A. That's what they say. Um, all right. We've got Jose um, Adjusti on board. Hello, Joe. And the Joyriders. How do you judge your ley line for the windward mark? Calculate for other sailors and wind shifts. This is a good question. And it's actually a great question because the arts and crafts department are going to be very happy that we can use these small boats uh, that we've been cutting out. So uh, if we've got, this is our windward mark on the race course. So um, the race course would usually be some form of upwind, downwind where we're sailing between two boys like this. And um, whether at some point we're going to need to go around the boy. And it is traditional in normal sailing boat racing um, that isn't long this uh, in course racing where we're sailing between boys to go around the boys this way. So we need to know where is the ley line. The ley line is what we call this imaginary line that if we can go beyond that imaginary line and tack, when we tack, we know that we're going to be able to get around the boy. So how do we judge that ley line? All right. So the first thing we can do, let's just take every, let's just assume we've got a steady wind um, and there are no other boats to worry about in the picture. We know that when we tack, we end up roughly at 90 degrees to the course that we start on. So that's our course going that way. That's our course going that way. A good, a traditional method of judging when you, um, what angle you're going to get when you tack is if we're going this way. So if I'm on the trapeze going this way, if you look over your back shoulder, if you can see the boy over your back shoulder, that means you can, when you tack, you'll be able to make it around the boy. That is a very old, it's, it's a very old traditional method, but loads and loads of people still use that method of judging the ley line. Um, another way of judging the, the ley line because, to know where 90 degrees is, is if you look along the front beam of the boat, when that is pointing, and just be aware that when you're judging the ley line, you need to make sure that you are sailing on the true course. If you're pointing really high, or perhaps if you bore away a little bit and you're going for sp speed, especially if you're doing that and you're taking this ley line off 90 degrees, when you tack, you're going to be too early. Whereas if you're pointing really high and you're taking the 90 degrees, when you tack, you're going to have tacked a bit late, which means that you'll have sailed more distance than you need to. But 
um, we can just look down the beam when we're sailing on a true upwind course. And when we look down the beam, if the beam is beyond, so if looking down the beam, obviously if we're double trapezing, this becomes a bit tricky, but we can see in front of the boy, that means we're definitely going to be able to make it around the boy. Now, in catamaran sailing, as the wind gets stronger, if we have sailed an extra boat length before we tack, it's not a big issue like it would be if we were sailing keel boats, for example. Because with a catamaran, if we're sailing upwind, um, scratch that. If we're if we've gone too far, and we have to bear away a little bit. The amount of extra boat speed that we get by having bore away a little bit is actually going to make up the distance that we've just sailed extra, especially if it's windy. So um, it's much better to be safe and go a little bit beyond the ley line uh, before you tack. Now, uh, the thing that makes it more difficult is if the windward mark is like over here, here's the course over here. If we're coming up the, the port uh, tack up here and we're tacking over here, the further away we are from the mark, the more difficult it is going to be to judge this ley line correctly because we don't know if the wind is going to hold true as we go along, it might start coming more from the left, which means if we've tacked at the right point here, that's going to take us away and we're going to end up having to tack again. Whereas if it goes the other way, then that's better, but still not ideal because we're actually going to end up reaching down to the mark. So it is trickier if we're tacking right the way over here. So in the early stages, and it's actually quite fortunate that in most races, going up the upwind the first time, you'll generally go off on starboard tack over here and tack more so you end up closer to the buoy, which means the distance that you have to sail on the starboard ley line at the top isn't going to be as far. There we go. Um, yeah, so I'm going to park that there, Jose. I hope that is helpful in some way. If um, if you'd like uh, f to stick in a follow up question, then feel free, of course. OK, continuing. Uh, Ryan in Maui, nice magnetic cat visual. A hey, Joe, that's a nice addition. Tell you putting the time in. And that's why I'm a channel member. There we go. And uh, prayers uh, for everyone in Ohio um, with this uh, tornadoes, isn't it? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've been cutting out little magnetic boats. I thought this would come in handy. And already um, I've saved a lot of pen time. All right. We've got Chris on board in Texas. Great to have you with us, Chris. Uh, Chris says, we almost ran into this situation two weeks ago. Oh, yeah. Um, back to the eject um, where a on a pitch pole that turned almost capsize. Yeah. So sometimes you go along. Hold on. We're flying a hull this way. Stick the bow in. And then you manage to save the pitch pole. And you end up going over sideways. So these things can happen, but on the lower volume, flat topped bow boats like the uh, anything with an asymmetric hole, basically, there's so little volume in the bows that if you put the deck under the water, you're going to flip it. Whereas Chris is sailing the Prindle 19, which has got a much more streamlined deck. So if you do put the deck under the water, there's more of a chance that it will come back out as long as you don't go flying forwards. 
<laughs> Ryan says mini cat magnets too. Look at that fleet. Oh, yes. All right. We got Hanny on board, channel member. Nice to have you on board, Hanny. Uh, Hanny is using the cat fever with yellow holes emoji, only available to channel members. There we go. All right. We've got Mr. Tony KP in Denmark, I believe. Hi there. Greetings from a road trip with the family. Very nice. Uh, OK, Hanny says, what if you didn't hold on? In January, I lost contact with the boat. Yeah, if, you, if you've if you capsized, you're in the water and you haven't held on to the boat. Which, you know, it ha I'd say probably a good 30% of the time when I capsize, I find myself in that situation where I'm not attached to the boat. Um, then what is really important is as soon as you come to the surface, you do your best impersonation of an Olympic swimmer to get back to the boat. Because if you, if you don't uh, respond immediately when you're in the water, and you give the boat a chance to get away from you, that is when you could lose contact. Um, so you would just hope in that situation that at least one person is in contact with the boat um, so they could perhaps actually force the boat upside down because when the boat's upside down, it doesn't have as much windage as when it's on its side. If you think about the boat on its side like this, wind blowing onto the trampoline, that's a good sail. That's going to blow it along fast. Whereas when it's upside down, there's much less. So if you do find yourself on the boat uh, with your sailing partner in the water, separated from the boat, then, um, and the boat is capsized like this, you're, you've managed to get on the hull. Just put as much weight on the top as possible and get the boat to invert completely. Um, and then if the boat is inverted, it, um, as long as the person in the water can swim, then they'll be able to get back. But most importantly, as soon as you realise you're in the water, if you're not attached to anything, do what you can to get to the boat as soon as you can. <laughs> All right. Chris says... That um, flat deck on the Prindle 19 is more treacherous than you would realise. There we are. All right. Uh, we've got Pearl Diver in the live chat. It's Roberto in Brazil. Very appreciate, appreciative of all your great work. Thank you very much, uh, Roberto. Thanks for tuning in. And um, always nice to be hitting as much of the planet as possible with uh, these broadcasts. Nice. All right. Benny says you need to capsize a couple of times to know uh, when you are at the point of no return. Yes, of course. Um, so if you haven't capsized before, don't be too scared of the capsize. It's actually really good for your sailing uh, to capsize from time to time. That's what I tell myself every time I stack it is, oh, this was a really positive thing that's happened. But if you don't know where the limits are, you're probably going to be sailing very much on the safe side, which is absolutely fine. You know, it's fine to sail on the very safe side. But if you're wanting to get more speed out of the boat, especially, and or if you want to race and you want to get towards the front of the fleet, get better performance out of the boat, then you do need to um, have capsized um, several times. There we go. All right. Um, Toot says, come to Texas and I'll fix y'all a good cowboy meal. Yeehaw. All right. Yeah. So if you make it to Texas on the 8th of April uh, for the eclipse race, Lake Buchanan, uh, Chris, oh, sorry, Toot is doing the catering. Very good. All right, we've got Thorn G on board in Germany. Uh, once fell from the boat because of tricky waves. 
boat didn't capsize and I remained, oh gosh, going fast, dragging through the water. Only chance I had was to steer the rudders from behind the boat. Yeah, I think sometimes it is forgotten that if you are behind the boat, like if this is your head, if you're behind the boat here, you can stick, like if you've been knocked off the back, which happens quite a lot, let's face it. Um, you can still reach forwards and grab the rudder, the tiller connecting bar. And with the steering of the boat, we can really use inertia to our benefit. So if the boat is dragging you quite fast and you're hanging off the back, if you push the rudders as far over this way as possible, so the boat heads up into the wind pretty quickly. The boat's going to stop pretty or slow down quite rapidly, which is going to send our water skier uh, flying forwards towards the boat, which is going to make it much easier to get back on board. Good point. Well put, Fawn G. Thank you. All right. We've got Leland Lee in Clearwater, Florida. Nice to have you with us, Lee. As always, uh, Toot says, could you spare a finger and hit the like button? That would be great. Uh, and perhaps at this time, I might even say, if you um, like catamaran sailing and you're not yet subscribed to Joyrider TV, I know a lot of people watch the videos not logged in. But if you could subscribe, that um, means you'll never miss anything. And it really helps me in my journey through this uh, YouTube stuff. Nice. All right. I believe is this Constantine in Russia from Russia with love. Thanks for your, your teaching. Thanks for tuning in. And I hope it's all um, going as well as could be hoped for in Russia. And um, Hope it's warming up a bit as well, because I, you know, now that I'm um, I've recently discovered winter sports and I've been looking at the the snow forecast a little bit more than the wind forecast. I'm not going to lie to you of late because it hasn't been particularly inviting to go in the sea. And I, you do see that Russia is very cold and there's a lot of snow about. So I hope that it's warming up. All right, Chris says, uh, this weekend at Lake Somerville, Texas, the Eads of March. Yes, uh, you still have time to get there and register late. Yeah, so uh, in if you are in Texas right now, it's only the morning. You've got all day uh, to make your plan of how to get to Lake Somerville and um, join in with the Eads of March regatta. And for any of these regattas that are going on, it doesn't matter if you've never raced before. All you need to do is know how a race works, which um, just check it out. Do a search on Joyrider TV and you'll find all sorts of information, which is going to basically tell you how a race works. And then, you know, on the start line of a race, here we go. We're getting stuck in now. Um, start line is usually between a boy. This is the let's let's be honest. The start line is the most intimidating part of the race. Um, so it would usually be between a boat, uh, like a fishing boat, maybe a keel boat, a yacht, or something, and a boy. And then the objective on the start is to be crossing the start line. Um, when the timer expires, upwind, start line got a bit bigger. And it's generally a good idea to be starting on starboard tack because of the right of way rules. If you're trying to start on port tack, you're not going to have any right of way. Now, if you haven't raced before and this just doing this appears quite daunting and you're like, well, I'm not sure if I can control my boat enough to not hit somebody else's boat, then that's all right. What you can do 
And this is a strategy that can actually mean you get a half decent result as well is um, when there's like 30 seconds to go for the start, you can have your boat just over here. Let everybody else go. And then so everyone else is gone. And then you just sail and start sailing upwind. So as long as you can sail upwind, you can sail across the wind and you can sail downwind. You're fairly happy with your tacks and your jibes. You know how to stop your boat, uh, which you do by sheeting out the sail and pointing up into the wind. Um, and um, yeah, and you could get around a course. Then uh, trying um, a race is a really, really good way of improving your personal sailing. So I would highly recommend it. There we go. All right. Um, where are we? Just if I was scrolling back, I'd be scrolling back. All right. We've got D on board. Hello, D. Um, thanks for thanks for joining us. My problem was always having to push a reluctant crew into the water before they pulled the boat down to a full inversion. Never a popular move. Yeah, sometimes when they're sort of holding on like this. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think this is why a, a good policy, perhaps, is like I said at the start, um, before you head out, maybe when you're preparing the boat, um, just to have a little chat about it. If it's someone you haven't sailed with before, especially just so that everyone kind of knows what to expect and what is the best practice if things happen. All right. Constantine um, says lectures at the beginning of the chat. That is a great idea. I'm glad that you approve. You're actually the first person who's mentioned it. Um, and I'm glad that we like getting stuck straight in to a strong topic. And I think especially um, it's been since uh, the start of the new year, having a featured topic each week. It means even if there's not so many preloaded questions, there's still plenty of content in each Q&A session. And it gives everyone time in the live chat to come up with some stimulating questions. Very nice. Uh, on that topic, if um, we could have no further questions, by um, for sure, um, make statements in the uh, live chat or even... Um, I tell you what, if you want to ask a question in the live chat now, you can do it, but only with a super sticker because it's um, we've almost been going an hour now. So uh, super sticker. Yes, you can ask a question. Um, if you've already asked one, that's fine. All right. Frank is on board. He's in Clearwater as well. Um, Frank, have you ever met Leland Lee and vice versa? Uh, maybe you sail off the same stretch. All right, Ryan says, tell us um, tell us where you sail, Roberto in Brazil. Tell us where you're sailing. And um, from Russia with love, uh, tell us where you're sailing as well. It, uh, it's very interesting. All right, we've got Gabriel on board in Benidorm, Spain. Nice to have you on board. Um, Toot says, retire. Coolio, the war ends. Yeah, I don't know what the context is there. Um, all right. Robert says, uh, middle-aged cat starter. In my first capsize, your instruction videos helped me to raise it again. Thanks very much. This is this is like it's so pleasing from my end of things to know that because you watched the video on how to bring the cat back upright, you've managed to do it. Where if you perhaps hadn't seen that video, you might have needed assistance from another boat if there was another boat there. So this really does your feedback, letting me know that this stuff actually works is really good. So thank you, Robert. And I'm glad it worked. Um, it's I like to think that everything that I'm preaching on the Joyrider TV is true. Um, 
at least it works for me. All right, Chris in Texas says, Texas City Dyke Yacht Club, who is running the Eads of March, ensures to have a B fleet for sailors with less than five years of racing experience. So at the Eads of March, starting tomorrow, um, if you haven't raced before, you won't be in a fleet with the experienced guys. You'll be in a fleet with more people with less experience. So it shouldn't be um, intimidating for you. So it's a great opportunity. All right. Ryan says, um, I've been seeing the professional race videos and the comments on the protesting and right of way rules. I don't understand any of it. Maybe a reaction video, if that applies, could be a good teaching tool as well. Yeah. Um, yes, in fact. Um, yeah, I think, however, in the next couple of weeks, I think the time for any reaction or any, any videos other than the ones that um, I've already got um, underway, I haven't got so much time with the world tour about to begin. And also there's been something else going on. I haven't even mentioned this, but all day and all day yesterday, I've been work working on what's being called Project Bad Boy 95. Yep, you heard that right. You've probably, uh, perhaps you're familiar with my boat, Bad Boy 94. Well, there's a new cat uh, in the fleet it's a Hobie 16. It's the one that everyone's been designing sails for. And it's called Bad Boy 95. And um, if you have a look on, uh, hopefully about 20 minutes after we finish, I'm going to have a video uploaded onto Instagram. Yeah, that's for young people. Um, Instagram, um, if, you don't, if you don't follow me on Instagram, my name on there is Total Joyrider. And um, yeah, I'm going to put a video, which is just a little uh, bit of what I've been up to today. But bad boy 95, I'm taking a 16 that it's like getting a cat from a rescue center because the boat it's come. It's a boat which was part of the wild wind sailing holidays fleet. And it was actually given to me as a gift, a leaving present uh, because I'd worked there for such a long time. And I've never actually owned a Hobie 16. So it's a, I'm absolutely chuffed to bits. That means happy, by the way, um, to have the. Uh, to have a 16. So I've been uh, cleaning her up. I've got the polisher out today. And wow, the difference that makes. Fantastic. And tomorrow I'm actually going to glue it together. Yes, I'm going to epoxy the pylons onto the beams to make it as stiff as possible. Very good. All right. So Gabriel in uh, Spain says, sure, you can help me. Measuring mast rake using the trapeze, one side is longer than the other. Could it be a bent mast or different length shrouds? The mast looks right. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So we've we've got the old um, measuring the mast rake technique where if this is the hull, this is the mast. Here we've got our bow fitting. All right. So the measuring your mast rake technique. And no, this doesn't work for Hobie 16s because the Hobie 16 has way too much mast rake on it. Is you take your trapeze wire and you probably have to tie a um, an extra bit of rope to your trapeze wire and you take it forwards, pulling it tight and you touch it onto the clevis pin of the bow fitting of the bow tang. Um, and that's like your, what would you call that? That's like chart datum. That's like your control. That's what's always going to be the same. Um, before you do that, yes, it's important to make sure that 
your um i've got all sorts of things here today by the way um that on your shroud adjuster the shrouds are on the same spot on both sides very important another thing that's important which could be a factor is make sure that the mast because the mast rotates the mast is completely central to the boat um and then you basically you lock this point in your fingers and then you take that point to the back of the boat so i've gone a bit too far off the back um to the back of the boat and depending on the type of boat you will touch that point onto the the hull and it might come a few inches in front of the transom it might come to the corner or it might actually go down the transom on the f-18 and tornadoes it's quite normal for this to come down the transom a bit now um gabriel is saying that he's getting different measurements on others on the opposite sides of the boat um yes yeah, so the reasons your measurements might be different hmm i would say first one is make sure that the trapeze line you're using on the other side in fact it won't make any difference because as long as you're touching it to here it doesn't matter the length of the trapeze wire because this is your control this is what you're measuring it against so Yes, make sure the shrouds are on the same setting. Yes, make sure the mast is central. Um, yes, make sure that if the mast is bent, that's going to give you a different reading. Perhaps your rigging is slightly different lengths, something like that. Um, yeah, but it, sh it should be the same. So without looking, it's very difficult to say, why that is um when i've got um my tornado belt i will actually have a look on both sides because usually i only measure one side i'll um get the rig tension on get what i think is the right amount of mast rake measure it to check it on one side only and then adjust as necessary but only on one side i don't usually measure it on both sides it's quite interesting all right. Leland Lee says, I sail at Gulfport Yacht Club. Um, and Frank says, no, we've never met. Well, now you know where to find Lee. Um, all right. Beg your pardon, too, for the bad pronunciation. Not Eads of March, Ides of March. There we go. OK, Scott says, um, speed puck thoughts or spend the dollar on something else? Good question. This is a Velocitech speed puck. Um, it's a GPS that you mount on your boat. And it's got, as you can see, a very large display that makes it nice and easy to see. Um, and yeah, the speed puck is good. But what I would like with the speed puck, if I, the, I'd say the only negative thing of the speed puck is no you can't wear it on your wrist um maybe you could i don't know but is it gives you that average over 10 seconds it doesn't give you a straight out it gives you at the time it will give you the um the actual speed that you're going and that is really nice if you've got it somewhere where you can see it so um the sale that uh, Chip at Whirlwind Sales is actually making for me, uh, if here's the sale, I'm getting him to put on the sale a clear pocket just near to the tack where the speed puck will sit inside. Yes, it'll only be on starboard tack, but that's OK. Um, so you can actually see it while sailing along. That is very cool. So if you see it and it's hitting like 22 and a half, you're like, oh, she's got more to give. Um, she in a bit, bear away, watch the bows. 
um, that sort of thing. Yes, I think it's a great device, but um, if I was going to buy something, uh, I think I don't know what these retail at. It's about three fifty, four hundred, something like that. Um, if you want something mountable, yes, this is good. I would prefer it if afterwards it could tell you what your maximum speed was as well as the 10 second average. Yes, you can get the maximum speed by downloading the files um, onto your computer and then using some third party software to analyze those um, those uh, files with all the GPS data in. Um, but I would probably, if it was me, I'd probably get some sort, another kind of wrist watch type thing, which at the moment I haven't got a favoured one because um, I haven't actually got one that works at the moment. So when I come to America, I'm going to bring speed puck so I know how fast I'm going because I haven't got a watch that tells me how fast I'm going at the moment because unfortunately the loco sis GW60 died and is no longer supported. Locosis basically gave up on it, which is a real shame because I really, really liked that one. There you go. All right, Chris says, Ryan, if you are near Texas, I'd be glad to have you out on my boat uh, to learn the rules. There we are. All right, Gabriel says, thanks. Glad to help. All right, we got epex1 e p y x1 uh from germany what should i check when getting my boat ready for the next season wow that's a big question to come at one hour and six minutes into the live chat but yes um what should you check rigging most important thing is the rigging the rigging that holds the mast up it's Perhaps not even check it, um, replace it. If it's if you sail by the sea and your rigging is more than five years old, really, you should replace it. Um, if you sail on a lake and the boat never goes anywhere near the sea, then probably I'm stretching it a little bit because I know rigging is quite expensive. But um, six years, maybe maybe even seven if you sail on a lake. Because also, if you sail on a lake, in the reasonably unlikely event of um, a shroud breaking, your mast coming down, if you're on a lake, you're more likely to get blown back to a bit of land. Whereas at sea, the consequences could be more significant. So, um, yes, uh, replace the rigging. Uh, what else? Well, check the rigging. One thing you can see with the rigging wires the only unless you can actually see that a strand has gone on a wire if there's a strand gone definitely replace it don't take these sort of chances because if the mast comes down you'll have to replace it anyway and mast falling down can damage your boat in other ways it could rip the sail could rip the trampoline it could ruin your day um, but at the top of, or the bottom of a rigging wire where you've got an eye, then inside the eye, you have what's called a thimble, which is like a metal insert that goes in there. If this metal thimble is cracked, this is a very good indication that um, that piece of rigging is due to be replaced so replace it so i would say that's the big one uh rigging second thing um when you're building your boat ready for the season is give your rudders a service they deserve it um but i think that's all i'm going to give you for now on the checks um all right scott says i will stick with strava on the phone very good Dave108 says $500 at West Marine for a speed puck. Anything cheaper? Uh, is there a cell phone app? Yeah, there are 
more and more cell phone apps coming all the time. Um, but the most straightforward, cheap and well, free and widely used. Although I would have to say it's not particularly accurate for what we're doing, but it's good enough for um, the speed stick at the moment is Strava um, is a good cell phone app. I know. Oh, yeah. I, I was hoping Chris would um, would come in on this one. He says, try the Garmin watches Riz with race cues. It's a wrist mounted sailing computer. I love it. It calculates ley lines, instantaneous speed, VMG, headers and lifts. Very good. All right. Uh, Ryan says YouTube is hitting me hard with ads and video restarts. Weird. I use. Um, sorry about that. Yeah. YouTube has started getting a little bit edgy, I think. All right. So um, Ryan uses an app called Water Speed. Sounds very appropriate for what we're doing. Yeah. Check that one out. All right. Um, Constantine says in Russia, I sail at Konakovo. All right. I'll check that out, actually. OK. And that brings us to the end. No more questions. Oh, no, we've got uh, Eric, I believe it is, uh, the E-Town um, Optimum Time Watch. Put me on the line, night and day difference. Oh, wow. Optimum Time Watch. All right. I think that's worth checking out. OK, I'm not shooting off just yet because I have got another preloaded question. But it's to be honest, I think I'm going to leave that the other preloaded question because the clock has been ticking. Um, if Max is watching this in Rosenheim, Germany. Sorry, Max. We're going to come on to this one next week. Um, well, not next week because I'm going to be on an airplane, but uh, in the next Q&A. But um, yeah, I've got to shoot off. Thanks, everybody, for getting involved. Uh, don't forget to hit the like button. If you're not yet subscribed to Joyrider TV, um, then hit the subscribe as well. Chris has been getting ads as well in the live stream. What is YouTube up to? Uh, stop with the ads. Or um, Hanny says, thank you, Joe. We could get rid of the ads completely uh, with the addition of, all right, it, um, you know, I've got to pay the bills. So I do tick the box that says yes to ads. And historically, they've put them at the start and the end, but they seem to have started inserting them during the video, so it seems. Um, but if there was enough revenue coming in from other means, then I wouldn't have to tick the box that says yes to the ads. Just going to leave that with you. So thanks very much. And I will, I should have definitely something coming out on Sunday. I was hoping for Show Us Your Cat, but Show Us Your Cat is so time consuming to make. And with my restoration work going on with Bad Boy 95, um, I haven't had time. And I don't know when that time is going to come because it's carnival weekend here on Lefkus Island. Yes, people are dressing up and drinking too much wine. All right. I'll see you next time. See you on Sunday with something. Thanks very much. Toodaloo. Bye-bye now.